How many Australians will be sacrificed for the USA's war on China? Coming up on Citizens Insight. Welcome to Citizens Insight, the Citizens Party's interview series on matters of national and international importance. My guest today, returning guest, is former Australian diplomat John Lander. Welcome, John. Thank you, Robbie. Good to be back. Well, it is good to have you back, but the reason you're back is not good. It's very, very bad. We thought it was a, you and I have done a number of conversations on this show over the last 12 months. Um, if you thought it couldn't get worse, it just has, yes. right? Which is why we're having this conversation. Um, so we have a lot to talk about, and it's going to be about this this war with China that our, our our major newspapers in Australia were trying to talk us into last week. But before we do, let's make an announcement that is entirely in fitting with this conversation, because we'll start with this and we'll we'll come back to this at the end, because we need to do something about it, yes. right? And on um, today's Monday. Uh, 13th of March, this Saturday, the 18th of March, there is a 20th anniversary rally, which is for the 20th anniversary of the protest preceding the war on Iraq, the, the illegal invasion of Iraq. And um, we'll put the poster up on the screen. We really encourage people, it's called a, a call for peace, truth, not war. And in Melbourne, We'll advertise the Melbourne one. It's at 1 p.m. at the State Library in Melbourne, this rally. Uh, and you're going to be one of the speakers at it, I believe. Yes, that's right. Uh, after um, a group of speakers uh, at the State Library, the rally will then uh, march uh, from there to uh, Treasury Gardens, where there will be some, some further speakers. Uh, the slogan for the rally, peace, truth, not war, the reference to, the, to truth is extremely important because uh, what we are highlighting in the uh, commemoration of the invasion of Iraq is that it was undertaken on the basis of a lie. Yep. Uh, the the so-called weapons of mass, mass destruction, which, are, which were shown to be completely non-existent. Uh, and we are being faced with the same process of lying to uh, convince the Australian population that there is no alternative to a war against China. Now, um, I remember the very first time I interviewed you on this program, John, we ended with me asking you what can be done about this. And you called then for an anti-war movement such as in the 60s and 70s against the Vietnam War, which was effective, right? And that's, that underscores the importance of this, pro, this protest rally on Saturday. Yeah. It is part of, we, of, of an anti-war movement that we must build in this country. Um, uh, and my comment on the, on the slogan is, it reminds me of what Julian Assange says, was his motivation in establishing WikiLeaks, wars are starred on lies, peace can be achieved through truth, truth. Yeah. right? Um, so let's just single out one of the lies in the case of the Iraq war because he's bobbed up again. Um, Peter Jennings was the uh, defence official or the, the government official, the, the advisor to John Howard, then Prime Minister, who explicitly advised John Howard that Australia should join the war in Iraq. And on, on the basis of all the lies at the time, weapons of mass destruction, etc. So he is, he is known as one of the explicit advisers to go to war, of course, and that advice was followed. Since then, in the 20 years since then, he has made a bigger name for himself as the long-time uh, director, executive director of the Australian Strategic Policy Institute. ASPE. ASPE, which you call? The, Austra the American Subversive Propaganda Institute. And you call it that because it's funded by, even though the majority of its funding come, comes from the Australian Defence Department, it receives an enormous amount of extra funding from the US State Department, which is its biggest forest fu foreign funder, but also the British government, the Dutch government, the Japanese government, and then a host of weapons manufacturers. And more than any other institution in Australia, under Peter Jennings, this became the propaganda agency to talk us into hating and and 
feeling the need to go to war on China. Would you agree? I agree. And, and uh, in their report to Parliament a couple of years ago on the, dis the dispensing of their budget, uh, they actually admitted in their report that the majority of the funding received from the armaments manufacturers and from the US was directed towards research projects aimed at China. Yes. So last week, the Sydney Morning Herald and the Age newspapers um, shocked Australia and much of the world, frankly, with these very dramatic headlines, front page screaming headlines, red alert, mm. um, showing images, we'll put it on the screen, of jets coming out of China, flying to Australia, that we are facing a threat from China, right? As if, as if the jets had already left the tarmac, John. <laughs> That's the urgency with which this was reported. And all it was, was a particularly nasty, sinophobic journalist at the Sydney Morning Herald, their international editor, Peter Harcher, who we have long identified in the top five of the most vicious sinophobes in Australia. And I'm sorry, I'm not holding back describing his character because he doesn't have any. This guy is the worst of the worst in the, in the, of an already pretty bad bunch in the Australian media. Peter Harcher assembled a panel of five supposed experts led by this same Peter Jennings mm -hmm. to um, assess the threat to Australia from China. And of course, given that it was led by Peter Jennings and two of the other of the five were also associated with ASPE, it confirmed, yes, China is this immediate threat to us. It predicted war with China in the next three years. And, and even, the, even the, Scott, the Murdoch Sky News was taken aback by that because they reminded people how in 2020 Peter Harcher was predicting, sorry, Peter Jennings was predicting war with China within three months, <laughs> right? So he's long been known for this. Well, he extended the time frame a little. <laughs> That's right. But he's extended the time frame entirely in keeping with, with what American analysts are predicting about this. And so suddenly you've got this, um, we all, we're, you know, you and I have long talked about this, that just the the propagandising for war, and it just went way over the top last week. Went with ballistic. The fair, fair, we went ballistic we're, to the point where, this, where the former Prime Minister of Australia, Paul Keating, who is already well, very outspoken on this, he took direct aim at Peter Harcher and the Sydney Morning Herald and The Age, and he didn't hold back yes. right, at the role that he called them warmongers. He said this is the worst he's, kind of war propaganda he's seen for 50 years. Yes. Right, and um, you've been around that same time. Would you? Would you? Would you, would you agree, agree with his with statement? Paul Keating. I mean, it, I don't think I've ever seen uh, war propaganda in Australia mm. of that uh, of that ilk. Uh, we've seen it in in other places. Uh, we've mentioned the fact that uh, Peter Jennings has extended the time frame a little bit, uh, but that is also in America's interest because we have to have time to spend vast amounts of the Australian budget on American armaments before. To, any such uh, conflict would begin. Um, but the time frame for the conflict is entirely an, a, an American construct. Uh, and I think this is the first lie. Yeah. Well, let's... OK, you mentioned the word lie. Let's talk about that. Back to what we said before, Julian Assange, you know, war has started on lies, mm. right? Um, we were lied into the Iraq war, and you would say, and I would agree, we're being lied to again to get us into another war so let's go through the specific lies and detail let in detail one by one uh, could i what, make the point that that you mentioned that peter jennings convinced uh, john howard to go to war in iraq when it became apparent that it was based on a lie john howard made the excuse that nevertheless we had to go to war uh, in iraq alongside America to preserve our alliance with America. Mm. And this is also the same argument today, that the, the uh, conviction that Australia uh, must inevitably be involved in any United States conflict against China is based on this notion that the alliance with America is all important and must never be weakened. 
uh, and that if we took a, a distinct and different position from the United States uh, with regard to China, that that would undermine our precious alliance with the United States. <coughs> but uh, the prospect of a war with China is in fact based on uh, quite a large set of yeah. lies. Uh, the first of these, of course, is that China is a military threat to Australia. Um, China has never, in any policy document that I've ever seen, uh, ever stated that Australia is an enemy, has never stated that, uh, that China is planning to go to war against Australia. The um, Chinese military build-up is given as an example of China's mounting aggression, uh, whereas it is clearly, um, whilst it's reaching a point where it is comparable to the United States in terms of its capability, it is completely different from the United States in terms of its posture. Uh, the uh, Chinese defence policy is explicitly focused on the defence of the territorial integrity of China. Yep. Uh, it has very little in the way of expeditionary forces and even the United States very proudly boasts that it has positioned itself in such a way that China cannot in fact, uh, conduct any expeditionary operations outside of its own immediate neighbourhood. So, <clears throat> whereas the United States uh, military power is, and has been for many, many years, explicit, explicitly expeditionary. It, it is to conduct operations far from uh, the United States mainland uh, in the so-called defence or the promotion of the United States position as number one in the world. And that is the first fact that I think needs to be remembered in any analysis, or in my analysis of what is happening. The first and most important fact is that the, that the United States has basically sworn to do everything in its power, including using war, to maintain its position as the uh, number one supreme power in the world. Mm. And that's, that's the Wolfowitz Doctrine. It will not tolerate a rival. That's right. Uh, we will not permit, permit. We will not permit any nation or grouping of nations to challenge the United States position as the supreme power in the world. Yep. They describe themselves as the indispensable nation. The implication of that is, of course, that all other nations on the planet are dispensable, and that includes Australia. Now, when you say China has not made these statements, such as we've just pointed, in, in comparison to like the Wolfowitz Doctrine, there are some people who will, whose comeback will be, well, of course they haven't, because the Chinese are conniving, uh, you know, untrustworthy, they wouldn't put it in writing what they're planning to do. Uh, it's like they're some kind of a special race that must not be trusted. In fact, I can think of a book called The Hundred Year Marathon that explicitly, by an American official, that explicitly makes this point that China is lying to us all and, and keeping its cards close to its chest while it secretly takes over the world. Um, so are you naive for putting faith or any kind of trust in, in China's statements? Should China be treated differently to, the, to America in this regard? Or do you think if they were, um, whatever their plans are, they would be making it explicit to the world? Uh, well, I would challenge anybody who is making that point to provide me with evidence from history, uh, in recent history, where it has been shown that China's been lying to the world. Yep. Now, we know from many examples in recent times that the United States has explicitly lied uh, and Iraq the, the occasion of the yeah. next week's rally is, is a very powerful case in point. Um, my own personal experience in dealing with China, and I reiterate that I was uh, Deputy Ambassador in Beijing in 74, immediately after recognising uh, the PRC, and I was Director of the China Section in the Department of Foreign Affairs on th three separate occasions throughout my 30-year career. Uh, I was personally responsible for negotiating all the details of uh, setting up consular, rela consular relations with China. Now, while those negotiations took me more than six months, never once 
did my Chinese interlocutor go behind my back. Never once did he say anything to me which ultimately proved to be a lie. Yep. Uh, I found in all my experience throughout uh, the, the long uh, period of my dealings with China that the one thing you could do was take them at their word. And uh, Prime Minister Albanese, with reference to Prime Minister Sogavari of the Solomon Islands, when Sogavari said, oh, the Solomons will never permit the Chinese or anyone else to establish a military base in the Solomons, because that would be tantamount to putting a target on our backs. Yeah. Albanese said we should take him at his word. If that's good enough for Prime Minister Sogavari, yeah. it should be good enough to take China at its word. Now, China um, has enunciated its uh, foreign policy in great detail at the 20th National People's Congress uh, late last year. And I think it would be useful to um, just quote a little bit from Xi, Jinping, Xi Jinping's speech to the National People's Congress uh, related to China's approach to the rest of the world. And he said, China is dedicated to peace, development, cooperation and mutual benefit. We will strive to safeguard the world peace and development as we pursue our own development and we will make greater contribution to world peace and development through our own development. That is a truly terrifying threat to the rest <laughs> of the world. Uh, I, and we, if we apply the same principle that Albanese has said we should apply to the Solomon Islands, yep. we should take Xi Jinping yep. at his word. That's what he said is his country's approach for the next five years. Yep. So a war started by China within the next three years does not fit with that scenario. Yep. What are other um, predicates of your statement that China is not a military threat to Australia? <coughs> the, well, the main one is the point that I made, that its entire posture is defensive. Uh, and uh, of course, it, its expenditure on military is only a third of that of the United States. Uh, the other point is that China has not conducted freedom of navigation operations in Australian waters. Australia has, China has not conducted freedom of overflight surveillance operations in Australian territory. Now, just to be clear on that, just a week or so, or in the week before the vote in the last federal election in Australia, then Defence Minister Peter Dutton lost his mind <laughs> to the extent where Scott Morrison distanced himself from him over a Chinese ship out in the Indian Ocean. In but international waters. In, exactly, in international waters. And what you're saying is in, the, um, in t our territorial waters, it is not coming and doing provocative uh, sailings through. Yeah. China does not send warships uh, on a regular basis through the Torres Strait. Yeah. There was one case where there was a Chinese destroyer sail, sail through the, the Torres Strait. And, and of course, we made an enormous amount of fuss yeah. about that. Uh, Whereas China in retrospect, like in, we, not retrospect, but in, um, uh, in contrast, in contrast, we are in their territorial waters all the time. We're in their face the yeah. whole time. Uh, just this week, uh, the, uh, the United States sailed another destroyer, uh, I think it was a destroyer, uh, through the Taiwan Strait. Now, both Australia and the United States' official position is that we recognise that Taiwan is a province of China. Taiwan is a, uh, an integral part of China's sovereign territory. Mm. There is a dispute between China, the Beijing and Taipei over who is the legitimate ruler of China. But there is no dispute between either side over whether Taiwan is a part of China's sovereign territory. So now that's point number one, but the most important point about that is that if we officially recognise Taiwan as part of China's sovereign territory, then Taiwan's territorial waters in the Taiwan Strait extend to the median line and the mainland China's 
territorial waters extend to the median line. There is no space in between which is international water. Yeah, yeah. And Taiwan's territorial waters are by definition Chinese territorial waters because we've explicitly acknowledged and accepted that Taiwan is a province of China. So for us, uh, or the Americans, or for us with the Americans, to sail up and down the Taiwan Strait is a highly pr provocative move, which China is not doing. We do not see Chinese destroyers sailing backwards and forwards through Bass Strait. It's never happened. No. Uh, but which uh, is which is your and, and which the, would be the equivalent? And the the American attempts to encourage a political movement in in uh, Taiwan to move towards um, a unilateral declaration of independence from China would be similar to the Chinese um, getting into Tasmania and encouraging Tasmania to declare itself independent from Australia. Um, and the, uh, the latest uh, elections within Taiwan, the municipal and county elections, made it pretty plain that uh, the majority of Ta the people on Taiwan do not to wish to disturb the status quo. They, <coughs> they were so much against the uh, DPP, the party that has been espousing the possibility of moving to independence, that the leader of that party felt obliged to resign her position as chair of the party mm. because it was such a rebuff to their policy of pursuing independence. <coughs> so Taiwan is quietening down the whole narrative of uh, China going to war to take back Taiwan. It can't take Taiwan back because <laughs> it's already part of China. But and, and you're, <coughs> when you talk about it like this, John, your, your statements are entirely grounded in international law, an understanding of international law, these definitions, etc., are based on international law. Yes, well, <laughs> even, even if it's not based on international law, it's based on the, the legal position that Australia adopted which is right, right. that we legally recognise the, the PRC as the uh, legitimate government of the whole of China. We also accepted that uh, Taiwan was part of China's sovereign territory. Uh, and that is the reason why, of course, we immediately uh, uh, disbanded our diplomatic representation uh, in Taiwan. Uh, we we retained the right and, then, and China agreed that we had the right to continue to, to conduct trade with, with Taiwan and people-to-people uh, -people exchanges and academic exchanges and so on. But the legal position we adopted was that Taiwan is part of China. And, and uh, as far as I can see, if, um, if there's no space between the, the juncture of mainland China's territorial waters and Taiwan's territorial mm. waters, there's no space in between that could be described as international waters, uh, then the, the high, whole idea of freedom of navigation operations uh, in what is legally China's territorial waters is um, an absolute nonsense. Now, of course, the United, Nations, the United States and Australia insist that the Taiwan Strait is, is in fact international waters. But, or at least that it, it should, it, that it is open to freedom of navigation operations. They Which are not provided for under the International Convention on the Law of the Sea. Right. Which makes it quite explicit that any country wishing to uh, send war vessels, not trading vessels, but war vessels, through another country's uh, territorial seas or, or even their, their exclusive economic zone has to advise that they intend to do so and have to receive authorization to do so. Well, of course, that doesn't happen. Um, the United States simply sails blithely through whenever they like. And, of course, we had the incident last year of a Chinese, sorry, a, a United States uh, nuclear-powered submarine colliding with an unknown object under the water uh, in the Straits of Taiwan, uh, which immediately, of course, uh, highlighted the possibility of uh, 
a nuclear accident uh, which would involve the nuclear uh, pollution of uh, the, uh, the mm. waters there and further, uh, and further abroad in the rest of the South China Sea, which is exactly the sort of thing that could, of course, happen uh, with nuclear power submarines plying off the coast of Australia. So you've said that unlike the United States, in terms of China being a military threat, unlike the United States, China is defensive, its posture is defensive, whereas the United States and with our assistance is expeditionary. China is not conducting freedom of navigation provocations, whereas the, China, the United States does all the time with our support. Um, what do you say to the claim that uh, China is preparing an invasion of Taiwan and then the more hysterical Australians saying that, who say after the invasion of Taiwan, they're gonna, China will then come to Australia. Um, and they put a time frame, and this is where the Peter Jennings thing came in, his, his three years came in, because the Americans have, are predicting, or people in America are predicting, that, that Xi Jinping will invade China, Taiwan within the next three years, and that's what Peter Jennings was echoing. What do you say to that claim? Well, the first imp most important point to point out is that China's policy towards Taiwan has not changed uh, since uh, uh, we've established relations with China way back in 1972. 50 years ago. It made it plain then, and it has restated, that policy has been simply restated at the 20th National People's Congress, that China reserves the right to use military force to counter any effort, either external or internal, uh, to Taiwan to move Taiwan to an independent status. That having been said, uh, the, and I think this is important to quote as well, Xi Jinping in his address to the nation for the, in the 2023 New Year, uh, very recently, um, reiterated the point that Taiwan is a part of China. He said, the people on both sides of the Taiwan Strait are members of the one and same family. I sincerely hope that our, our compatriots on both sides of the Strait will work together with a unity of purpose to jointly foster the lasting prosperity of the Chinese nation. That doesn't sound like a threat, and certainly not like an imminent threat. Um, it is exactly the opposite. Uh, China's policy has always been the eventual full integration of Taiwan into uh, the Chinese economy and the Chinese polity will be a process of evolution. Yeah, which as evidence was happening thanks to the rise of China economically, Taiwan, which like every other country, most country in the world is entirely dependent on China, yeah. and the Taiwanese and the Chinese economies were coming more and more interlinked. And so this, this was looking like it was eventually going to happen. It was in that direction until this explicit foreign interference operation from the United States to create, yeah, well, stir up this democracy we've, movement. We've talked about it before, but, but uh, China's principal trading partner is mainland China. Uh, Taiwan's principal yep. main trading partner is mainland China. The trade between Taiwan and mainland China is almost a billion dollars. Um, the uh, biggest employer, or one of the biggest employers of Taiwanese workers are factories on mainland China. Yep. The workers travel across the strait on a regular basis. Uh, <clears throat> the uh, um, biggest destination for Taiwan's overseas investment is in fact mainland China. And the biggest investor in Taiwan from outside is mainland China. So the economic and social ties between the mainland and Taiwan are evolving and deepening uh, every single day. And this is what Xi Jinping refers to yep. as the peaceful evolution of the reintegration of Taiwan completely within the one and the same family. Um, and there is no talk of invading, which is a completely misuse of the term, um, uh, China, China invading Taiwan 
at any time in the near future or even in the distant future, China has said quite explicitly the only circumstance in which they would use force is if some outside interference is moving Taiwan towards separation from China's sovereign yep. territory. So the other, the other claim, and I think I regard this as the least serious because it, it appears on 60 Minutes a lot, but the other claim that China's a threat to Australia um, involves this headline that, oh, China has threatened to rain nukes down on Australia. And this, <laughs> this, this, the source of this claim is, is a few 60 Minutes interviews with a Chinese um, individual named Victor Gao who's a private analyst, he's not a spokesperson of the Chinese government. Exactly, so that, that's, the f that's the first point. Anyway, but elaborate please, what would you say about this claim? Uh, well again, it's nonsense, uh, and it's a total misinter misinterpretation of, of what Victor Gao said. And it's what he said is, has not been said by the Chinese government. Yeah. But what he said was that if Australia uh, adopted a position of military hostility against China, we would inevitably be making ourselves a target for a Chinese response. And that would potentially be a nuclear response. Uh, so again, the, the idea that China is threatening Australia with nuclear weapons is a, a complete misconstruction of what is happening. Uh, China's nuclear capability, again, is fundamentally defensive mm. um, and is nowhere near the size of uh, the United States' nuclear capacity. And one of the great dangers, I think, of Australia adopting nuclear power submarines, which, as Richard Miles says, will enable Australia to increase the range and the lethality of our warfighting capability is the implication that we will be operating these nuclear submarines in the South China Sea within China's neighbourhood yep. rather than uh, around the periphery of Australia where they wouldn't be capable of sailing anyway because it, the technical experts tell us the waters around Australia are too shallow mm. to accommodate such large submarines. But that the use of those submarines is quite clearly targeted against China's marine nuclear launching capability. So we are planning to threaten China's capacity to respond to a nuclear strike. Which makes China defenseless. Which is making, we are... Uh, positioning ourselves to make China less defensible yep. by, by China uh, and certainly making it less defensible against any nuclear strike by the United States. And the only way so far that the world has found to avoid nuclear holocaust is to maintain a balance of strike capabilities. Yep. Uh, and the United States, uh, the warmongers in the United States have already, already been talking about the fact that the United States is now, nuclear, from a nuclear point of view, is a much greater power than either Russia or China, so that the United States can afford to proactively use nuclear weapons without fear of retaliation, which is complete insanity. Mm. And all it does, it makes the world a much more dangerous place because it makes the targets very, very fearful and therefore forces them to do things that they otherwise wouldn't do. And isn't that why we're in a war in Ukraine well, right now? That's why we're in a war. We are involved in a war in Ukraine. And we, of course, we say we're not. But uh, under, under uh, international law, any country that provides uh, war fighting equipment to another country is a co-belligerent. Yep. So technically we are at war with Russia. Yeah. Which means, of course, that um, if things go really badly for Russia, we are leaving ourselves open to a, uh, a retaliatory strike by Russia, yeah. let alone by China. Um, so uh, 
but the 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 um, famous Nazi uh, German um, politician uh, Goebbels said quite clearly that the way to get the people of the country to support going to war is to make them afraid. Mm. So we are now seeing a massive increase in the wave of war propaganda designed to make the Australian people fearful and therefore to manufacture consent to a war posture by Australia. So last year you came on this program and you um, shared your view of the grave danger facing Australia, which you have repeated many times since then, and you got to repeat in January to a pretty important presentation to an organisation in America called the Committee for the Republic, and you, you, you laid out your thesis of, of, of what is happening, what is driving this, this, this um, uh, uh, the war tension between the United States, Australia and China. So why don't you just restate that now and we'll talk about the backlash that's, or, the, or the response yes. you've received. Yes, well, of course, um, the, the Committee for the Republic is a very large uh, organisation of uh, diplomat diplomatic, uh, military and academic people who are opposed to United States forever wars. Yep. Uh, and um, after quite a lot of negotiation with the, um, the key members of that grouping, they invited me to address uh, what they called their salon of um, where they get speakers to address the entire committee. And they asked me explicitly to address the question of the ANZUS Treaty and the alliance with the United States. And putting it quite bluntly, I said that the United States is not preparing to go to war against China. The United States is preparing Australia to go to war against China. And I have said that many times and I will keep restating that until people actually begin to listen. But the main point was that I, I showed in, in great detail was the extent to which Australia is now within what I call the suffocating embrace of the United States. Yep. The United States economic control of Australia is far greater uh, by multiple times uh, than any kind of economic control that uh, China may have established in Australia in terms of buying, a, or sh buying shares in a mine or uh, taking a lease over a port. Uh, every single major company in Australia on every single sector of the Australian economy is majority owned by American shareholders. Mm. And that includes our financial sector. It includes our mining sector. It includes our media sector and entertainment. Uh, and all of this has taken place over a very long extended period of time since the signing of the ANSYS Treaty. Um, and it has been, and it's that treaty and everything that has evolved under that treaty including the force posture agreement about which we really should say something more and the AUKUS agreement and so on. They are all devolved from the ANZUS Treaty which is the, um, the defining document for the alliance between Australia and the United States. And the United States has always used the alliance as a means to drag Australia into the United States conflicts all around the world, yeah. Vietnam, Iraq, Libya, um, uh, Afghanistan, etc, etc, etc. So uh, the United States has positions of influence in our defence policy making uh, area. We've mentioned Peter Jennings and Aspie. Uh, it has a, an enormous influence on policy making in Canberra. Uh, the United States has its own personnel uh, embedded within the Australian Defence Department and within the Australian Defence Forces. So that also creates a very uh, strong ability for the United States to influence Australia's policy. In fact, it, it it's, uh, oh, should be described as state capture, yep. um, that we have been, in, in a sense, completely captured by the, the whole United States political machine. Um, and 
how to extricate Australia from that is uh, very difficult to see. The, the one point on which every observer, including the warmongers, agree is that were the United States to directly engage in a war with China over Taiwan or anything else, Australia would be involved. Mm. And um, one person asked, asked me, but surely Australia could make up its own mind. Australia would have the choice of whether it would go to war or not. And the answer to that is no, we do not have a choice. The American military assets the, that, are being, that are in place in Australia now and which are uh, being uh, increasingly emplaced in Australia, the, the um, Indo-Pacific Command Headquarters is based in Darwin. The uh, Command and Control Centre for the provision of intelligence information, targeting information, uh, and the control uh, the, of uh, the operation of warships air and aircraft in the, the South China Sea and uh, in the whole of the Western Pacific is controlled from the communication station at Pine Gap. So the United States conducting a war in the South China Sea will conduct it from Australia. Uh, and that means, of course, that Australia is immediately a target uh, because it would be quite remiss of any military planner in China to forbear from attacking the principal headquarters for the conduct of United States hostilities in, in their region. Yeah. So we, we are uh, inevitable. I mean, when Peter Dutton said it is inevitable that we will be at war with China if war breaks out, that is absolutely true. Mm. The outrageous part of my statement was, that, that in fact, that that the United States is preparing for Australia to be a proxy in such a war. And it is knitting together an alliance of such proxies, Japan, the Philippines, Australia. We have now agreed that those countries can engage in joint military exercises in Australia as part of Australia's efforts to build up a so-called defensive alliance against China. That has to be seen in China as offensive not defensive, yeah. and it's quite clearly um, designed to, pr to uh, pursue uh, a more hostile approach. So Australia is caught in an absurd policy paradox. At the political level, we say we want a cooperative relationship with China uh, where we um, manage our differences uh, politically and diplomatically where we can build a trading relationship with China. So we're telling China, we want to continue trading with you so that we can earn enough dollars to buy all the equipment that we will need to go to war against you. Yeah. Um, which is quite an, is an insane position to adopt. But that is literally what we're doing. Uh, and <laughs> Putting it another way, we are saying our trade with China is so important that we have to protect our trade routes, so we have to go to war against China to protect our trade with China. Yep. Uh, which is, that's not originally from me. I mean, that has <laughs> been said before. But it is nevertheless a truism. Uh, so um, we're, we're just uh, quite schizophrenic mm. uh, in our approach to China. Well, uh, your thesis got a bit of attention after you went on uh, your appearance at, to the Committee for the Republic and you were quoted in some international press, including Chinese international press. And one of the comebacks, one of the attacks you came under was from a trade publication called Defence Connect, which is a trade paper for arms manufacturers. And they explicitly are. They're, they say, we're here to help people make money from the biggest spend on arms since World War II, yes. right? So they had an article attacking you, and I'll just read you the quote. Um, Perhaps Lander's most outrageous claim is the United States is manipulating Australia, its policymakers, and the strategic policy community 
to prepare the nation to fight instead of the United States. So what do you say to that? Well, everything in that statement is true. And the article didn't in fact refute any of that. It was just the last little bit instead of the United States yep. that, uh, that uh, that article took issue with. And that's a question of interpretation, of looking at the facts yep. and assembling the facts and saying, where is that leading us? The United States has declared it will not allow any power to uh, challenge the United States. The United States has explicitly stated that it will conduct its wars against its major adversaries by proxy. The United States has demonstrated its, its, its ability to conduct a war against at least one of its adversaries by proxy in Ukraine. And they have been quite explicit at, in describing Ukraine as the proxy for the war by democracy against autocracy. The United States has admitted that its strategists are aiming at goading China into uh, attacking Taiwan in order to provoke a proxy war between China and Taiwan with the so-called uh, so supporters of Taiwan, Japan, Philippines, Australia, as additional proxies. Mm. But the one thing that the United States has never said to Australia during the negotiations of the ANZUS, ANZUS Treaty or since, it has never said that the United States will come in to protect Australia. It has always said the United States would consult with Australia <coughs> to provide Australia with what it needs to protect itself. And in the latest Osmin talks in the United States, when Penny Wong and Richard Miles met with the Secretary of State and the Defence Secretary, De Defence Secretary Austin said, the United States will not leave Australia with a capability gap with regard to the submarines. That's doublespeak for saying the United States won't protect Australia. It will only provide Australia with what it needs, needs to protect itself. So all of the facts as I see them are leading to the conclusion that the United States would not directly engage in a kinetic, as they call it, conflict with China. Moreover, Richard Miles has very proudly announced in Parliament that the United States forces based in Australia are interchangeable yep. with the ADF. That's an extremely important word. They are no longer interoperable, meaning that they're separately identifiable forces. They are interchangeable, which means that they have the same identity, which means that all of the United States military assets based in Australia, if a war occurs, can readily be identified as Australian military assets engaged in such a war. And the United States would be able to maintain the fiction that it is not directly engaged in a war with China, and therefore it is not laying itself open to a nuclear conflict between itself yeah. and China. And the model for this kind of proxy war is what's happening in Ukraine Yeah, right I mean, now. we can see it happening right now in, in Ukraine. And I have absolutely no doubt in my mind that that is exactly how it would play out for Australia in uh, any war that America instigates uh, against China. Yep. Uh, that they will uh, stand to one side. They won't hesitate to pour in the maximum quantity of weaponry and armaments and ammunition and everything else that Australia and Japan and the Philippines and maybe South Korea will need to, to confront uh, uh, China, but they won't actually send their own warships in uh, and, and make themselves a target yep. uh, in the South China Sea or anywhere else. So uh, China is simply saying the, that the, they have no intention of taking America's bait. What, where we have ended up is, uh, I think, very clearly enunciated by Scott Ritter, who is the uh, former US uh, 
Army weapons inspector who actually was tasked with the, uh, the job of discovering the weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. And of course he did not find them and he has subsequently stated very publicly that he did not find them and that the whole thing was a lie. And sp speaking... And he, is he has now been speaking out quite publicly on the subject of Australia's role in the United States confrontation of, with China. And I think it would be good if we just let him speak for himself. Exactly. Let's roll the tape. Let's, let's just be frank. I mean, let's just put the cards on the table. Australia is not a military powerhouse. So the idea of Australia serving as a proxy uh, in a U.S. war against China is absurd in the extreme. Uh, Australia would be a tool, a minor tool. Uh, Australia provides some uh, geographic uh, advantages in terms of the basing of U.S. military equipment, but the Australian military is useless in a general war against China. Uh, even your submarines would play a minor role, and that role would be terminated rather quickly because I don't believe they would survive a, uh, a general war against China. And this is what Australia needs to understand. Um, you know, America, the, the America, this isn't, you know, World War II with the Japanese Empire knocking on your door where you needed the United States to come in and be your close ally to defeat the, the Japanese back. The Chinese aren't knocking on your door with, um, with an invasion force. The Chinese are knocking on your door with economic opportunity, economic opportunity that the United States is not able or willing to provide. Um, Australia needs to look out for its own best interests and its own best interests will be defined by a mutually beneficial relationship with that, that power or group of powers who seek to respect Australia's needs, wants and desires insofar as they pursue a peaceful coexistence with the rest of the world. The United States is not offering that. The United States is offering you death, destruction, nuclear annihilation. You put American bombers on your soil, your soil becomes a target for Chinese nuclear weapons. And Australia will disappear that quick. So it's up to the Australians. You're, you're allegedly a sovereign nation. Um, act like one. If not, lower the Australian flag, kick the queen out, and admit your status as an American colony. Now, speaking of coming full circle, John, I mean, we started off talking about the 20th anniversary of the Iraq war. I remember Scott Ritter toured Australia before that invasion saying, I was there, I never found any weapons, this is rubbish. And he did a speaking tour of Australia, did a speaking tour of the world. He put his reputation on the line to warn the world against that war. His credibility is way up there. The people he's speaking out do not have any credibility, they're liars. And he's now delivering precisely the same message to us as Australians about what we're doing vis-a-vis -vis China. Yes, and uh, that brings us back, of course, to the whole point of the red alert uh, and the credibility of the so-called panel uh, and the fact that almost every member of that panel uh, has some direct connection with ASPE, yep. which, of course, is a, an American tool of propaganda um, uh, an honest appraisal of the security situation facing Australia by such a panel would have included people who have expertise on China. Yep. There was not a single member of that panel who had any experience of China, had no expertise of China, had never been involved in any study of China's history on the evolution of China's uh, development over the, the last 70 years. Um, they provided no opportunity for any counterpoint to their narrative that China was about to launch a war against Australia. Well, John, in, let's, let's wrap this up, but I want you, this goes to your personal outlook now, because in this Defence Connect article, um, they took, they, it was online and so people were allowed to make comments. And I want to read out one of the comments that was directed at you and get your response to that. Mr. Lander's claims are more fatuous than explosive. It's inconceivable that any serious US policy would rely solely on the Australian military as a proxy for defence in the Indo-Pacific. His fondness of China is telling. So do you feel that your perception is skewed by a fondness of China? Uh, no, I do not. My fondness is for Australia, and the reason that I'm speaking out now, after having been silent for so many years, is exactly because I am afraid for Australia's future. Uh, 
the, my fondness for China is irrelevant. It is as irrelevant as his obvious fondness for the United States. Mm. They are both not relevant to the argument. The, what we need to examine are hard concrete facts that have emerged over time, which of course we have discussed at great length. Um, another critic uh, who commented on the article actually accused me of having received Aldi bags stuffed <laughs> full of cash uh, to act as a proxy for Chinese propaganda. Well, apart from that being totally libelous, yep. um, I made it quite explicitly clear in my interview with uh, Chinese media, uh, the Global Times, that I was speaking only in Australia's interest and that under no circumstances would I accept any form of emolument for giving an interview to Global Times. Mm. Uh, so um, I could possibly be in a position to sue that person for libel if I knew who they were, because yeah. he didn't have the courage to put his name it to the comment. But <coughs> uh, my, the, the, the personal feelings of individuals who are, who are involved in uh, examining the strategic situation in which Australia has placed itself are not relevant. The only thing that is relevant are the actual facts, what is actually happening, what has been said and acted upon by the various sides. Uh, and we've uh, dealt with that today. And, yep. and I think the clear answer is that the United States is embarked on a campaign of extreme belligerence towards China. And China is not embarked on a campaign of extreme belligerence towards Australia. They have never once described Australia as an enemy. Australia has described China as an enemy quite often. Mm. They have not responded in kind. Uh, which is incredibly telling and hopefully something that people take on board. So let's just go back to where we started though, because there is, you know, we can't have a conversation like this and just leave it hanging. We need to do something about it, yes. right? Yes. And that requires an anti-war movement in Australia. And if you didn't think it was bad before last week, go back and look at those Sydney Morning Herald front pages and, and uh, confirm it for yourself. Have a look at the statement Paul Keating put out, um, which was very, very powerful. John's confirmed the same view. You know, this is, es this is escalating very, very dramatically. And one thing I've always thought about is if you're Russia or China, given this is the 20th anniversary of the invasion of Iraq, if you're Russia or China, you watched how that Iraq, that invasion was orchestrated, right, with a lot of propaganda, a lot of claims, yeah. a lot of media hysteria, yeah. and they had a plan, and, the, and later on, as it, as it was um, investigated, the plan was many years in the making. They seized on 9-11 to, to, to achieve this plan, and what that showed is the most powerful country in the world will go to any lengths to achieve their goals, right, of invading the, a country. The, the goal of supremacy. Goal of supremacy. And if you're, if you're their two main rivals, you know, how could you ever trust them when they say to you, you know, trust us, we're no, like they've said to Russia. Oh, yeah, trust us, we won't expand NATO. Trust, trust exactly. us, we've, got, we've, we've concluded the Minsk agreements and you can, yeah. you can go by that. Uh, and then uh, they an announced it was just a subterfuge to give uh, time to arm Ukraine. Uh, and that's how you end up in a war the, like this. So uh, the, the only way that we will not end up in a war like that is by um, calm negotiation yep. based on trust and trustworthiness. Uh, and time and time again, uh, the United States is giving cause for the rest of the world to distrust it. Yep. Uh, and of course... Um, the entire global south, the two-thirds of humanity, have made it pretty plain in recent times that they don't trust the United States. Um, we do, we, we, the, and the Australian population in general, it strikes me as being very like um, the passengers on uh, a train out of control. We are speeding towards the precipice yep. on the American train, and quite complacently enjoying the ride. 
uh, until, we, until, we, yeah. until we go over the edge. Uh, and then we won't be enjoying anything late. anymore. Yep. But we need to have uh, the vast mass of the passengers on this, this uh, uh, what's the stampeding train, well, the, the, the out of control train, to collectively engage in putting on the brakes. Yes, hence the need for these anti-war protests. Such and as the Richmond. rally on the 18th this coming weekend, I think is extremely important. Uh, and it's not only in Melbourne, but it's going to be in all the other uh, capital cities as well. And I want to I want to announce so so remember that this Saturday, 18th, 1 p.m. in Melbourne at the town hall. Look up the details in other in other states. We'll put as many below as we can. But I also want to point out that the next day, Sunday, the, in, if you're in Sydney, Sunday the 19th of March, there's a public meeting at the Marrickville Town Hall, and it's it's called it, the headline is "We Live in Troubled Times: Can War Be Avoided or?" Will Our Peace Be Shattered? And it will be addressed by Professor Bob Carr, former New South Wales Premier and Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator David Shoebridge from the Greens, Dr Alison Bronowski, who is the President of Australians for War Powers Reform, and very, very importantly, Colonel Lawrence Wilkerson, who was the assistant to then US Secretary of State Colin Powell at the time of the Iraq invasion. Yes. And of course, Powell famously gave famously told that lie at the United Nations. He held up the little vial. And later on, he expressed real regret for that, yes. right? It, it ruined his, uh, his, his career and he always regretted it. Well, Lawrence Wilkerson was his assistant and Lawrence Wilkerson ever since has been very, very outspoken. So he will be addressing this event yes. on Sunday via Zoom. It'll be hosted by Mary Kostakidis. Um, so if you're in Sydney and you can go along to the Marrickville Town Hall at 4.30, or look for details to participate online, please do that as well. Uh, and I just add, would add, I've been in uh, correspondence with, with Lawrence Wilkerson. Uh, we've um, had quite a, an exchange of emails with each other and he, of course, publicly made the point that if Australia places uh, bombers, American bombers in Australia, as he put it, you are painting a nuclear target on your back was what he said. Well, there you go. It's time to listen to the people who have credibility on these issues like John, like Scott Ritter, like Lawrence Wilkerson, not the, not the machine, the war machine that funds ASPE, that comes out of the United States and the United Kingdom, um, that has always led us into these wars. But this one's the big one, which we will never, su never survive. So John, thank you for coming here. Um, I won't thank you for the content. That's just the reality. That it, it is, unfortunately. I appreciate you being as outspoken as you are. We want to be outspoken because our party is a party of Australian patriots. We want our party, to, our nation to survive and prosper. And that means first and foremost, avoiding wars. So um, please help us share this program that you've just heard, uh, you've, you've just listened to. Let's get it out, um, like it, uh, make comments. That's very important to, you know, please give us your feedback in the comments, but that helps the algorithm to share it. Share it as widely as possible. And if you can, like we said, get along to those anti-war protests on the weekend. So thanks, John, again. Thanks to the viewer for tuning in to this episode of Citizens Insight.